Hi folks, how do we get really accurate parts off of our Haas ST20Y? So when I first started machining, I thought accuracy meant if we wanted say a half inch part, it was that machine's ability to make a half inch part. But the trick is not how do you get just the first part to be that correct dimension, but how do you get the 10th part and the 100th part and the 1000th part to be that correct dimension? <laughs> and I've got good news and bad news. The good news is it's really only one thing, but the bad news is that one thing is thermal control. Now to be clear, yes, there are absolutely other factors that come in to accuracy and repeatability. Those things can range from work holding to tool pressure to the cutting insert, tool wear, tail whip in your bar stock. And while those factors are all real, they're also the sort of things that once you figure them out, they tend to be pretty good. Whereas the whole element of thermal growth, thermal expansion, and how heat affects the whole machine tool and the casting in your parts is a little bit trickier. It is not possible to overstate what a key role thermal growth plays in so many aspects of machining. A couple of my favorite anecdotes. Number one, we were taking a scraping class with Richard King. And Richard was telling a story when he was reconditioning a machine, scraping it in. He had used his metrology tools to achieve a certain tolerance, a certain flatness, and then he came back the next morning and everything was wrong. And he waited a while, he remeasured, he rechecked, and he couldn't figure it out. And it ends up that there was a window in the building and at a certain point, the sun was passing through and shining sunlight on the casting and that sunlight was heating it up and moving it out of tolerance. The other anecdote was when we saw our first Kern CNC machine at Nicholas Hacko, the watchmaker in Sydney, Australia. And that Kern has as many things that generate heat like the electronics literally separated from the machine to thermally isolate them. And that's something that you see as you step up to more expensive machines, you'll have things like active cooling where they'll pump liquid through the casting or liquid through the ball screws. They'll have more measuring points to measure the temperature. They'll either try to actively cool the machine or measure it and be able to do software type compensation. Luckily though, there's actually some simpler things that we can do. First off is control your machine environment. If at all possible, keep the temperature relatively consistent in your shop. That may mean heating it in the cooler days. And if you have the chance to air condition or climate control your shop, I would highly encourage you to consider it. The benefits of air conditioning, aside from temperature regulation, it's a much nicer place to work and you're gonna help regulate and control humidity. It's not just the shop environment, but any sudden changes to the shop environment. And that's actually the incident that led to us researching this and ultimately creating this video. We thought we had our lathe perfectly dialed in. We thought it was running great. And then all of a sudden, our parts moved by almost a thousandth of an inch. And that was not characteristic of this machine. I was really surprised. I was frustrated. I felt stumped. And then it hit me. We opened a roll-up door, sort of on the other side of the shop, but that additional airflow was enough to change the thermal element, the temperature and so forth of the room or the environment around the machine that it caused an immediate change in the diameter of the part we were turning. I later confirmed this by testing it yet again, and sure enough, yes. So do not underestimate, again, whether it's a window and sun shining in, or somebody cracking a door and having a current or an airflow breeze blow across it. It absolutely has an impact on it. The next thing is warming up the machine itself. So we have a warm up routine. I think it actually came with our pause lathe and it's relatively short uh, and we run it, especially if we haven't run the machine for a couple of days. Um, I actually thought it had a lot more to do with just not going straight into production mode, maybe giving the little bearings a chance to come off completely cold and so forth. But we have a different warm up routine that we run much longer when we really want to bring the whole machine completely up to temperature. So it's not just the spindle, but it's all the cast iron, it's the coolant and it's other things that generate heat which range from coolant pumps to driven tool holders. Heat isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's changes in temperature. So what we wanna do is find the temperature, find the environment that the machine is stable at, and then it will be kind to you. That's what we've absolutely found on this machine is once we get it up to temperature, we are good. We've also heard this anecdote from uh, friends that have other machines, some of them way more expensive. They move quite a bit from total cold to up to operating temperature, but once they get up to temperature, they're pretty good, they're pretty stable. So this is all for our diamond pins, which is the part that we have a really critical tolerance on. So we use NC programs and we have the NC program that runs the actual part. And then we have a second one that's just the warm up routine. We just have a few selected uh, operations for that warm up routine and then we loop it. And I know when that warm up routine is done, the machine will be up to temperature. 
So that's step one. Step two is to then take uh, the final critical cutting tool. For us, it's a V-shaped insert that cuts that final geometry. And we want to touch that tool off or update its wear offset after the machine is already warmed up. It doesn't do you any good to use your tool probe and touch that off when the machine's cold because it's when it, the cast iron and the machine frame warms up, that's when the changes happen. I don't worry about the other tools and the roughing tools because this movement of warm to cold is in the few thousands of an inch. So it's not really something I care about on the roughing inserts and so forth, just on that finishing tool. This warm up also brings the coolant up to temperature. Um, we've gotten along fine just doing that. We have seen other shops use larger volume coolant tanks. Having a larger volume of coolant helps minimize any temperature swings or a lot of the shops that are doing production, lights out, running, et cetera, are using coolant chillers because ultimately the coolant gets hotter than you would like. And so you use chillers to both bring it down, but really just to regulate and keep that coolant temperature consistent. Because remember that coolant is often splashing all over the machine frame. Sometimes it's sheet metal, sometimes it's the actual casting itself. That is conduction cooling or heating. It's just like the difference between putting your hand under into cold air versus putting it under cold water. That direct contact makes a massive difference in how efficient it is to transfer heat or temperature change into a part. I've been blown away. Uh, it's probably a testament to just modern CNC machines at how well built uh, and accurate and capable that they are. We're trying to hold a few tenths of tolerance on this part, uh, and that's on a turning dimension, which means if I want to adjust the diameter by one ten thousandth of an inch, in the US that's what we call it a tenth, that's about 0 0.002 millimeters or about one fortieth the thickness of a sheet of paper. You actually have to move the X axis on your lathe by half that distance, the radius. So you're asking that ball screw and that linear truck to move 50 millions. And we found that this actually works. The machine is capable of it. It's not something that I would have expected or certainly if somebody said hey I want to buy this machine I want to hold tenths all day we kind of joke about that like machine tool vendors will tell you these tolerance numbers and they're uh, sometimes seem a little bit crazy but a lot of it has to do with building that process around it and so far we've been able to run these in batches we do 100% inspection on them and it's been surprisingly consistent we've been really happy with it so we knew the machine could do it, but only when it was up to temperature. So we wanted to build a software way to help control that. But before we dive into those details, a couple of uh, noteworthy mentions. We're feeding in 40 inch long pieces of raw material. So when we first start out, we've got over 35 inches to the left of our chuck. That material is supported in a series of interchangeable tubes called spindle liners. Uh, we got the ones from Haas. They're slightly oversized, meaning the bar has a very small amount of wiggle room inside that spindle liner. That amount of slop can affect, believe it or not, what's happening on cutting tolerances on the other side of the chuck where you're actually cutting your parts. Two solutions that we know of, one is that sometimes we'll put a piece of electrical tape on the raw material just to help soak up a little bit of that difference in the spindle liner. We've also heard of folks buying custom sized or tighter tolerance spindle liners. A trusty Cook is a company I've heard of uh, that offers these. We've gotten along fine with the liners that came with our machine, but it's worth just worth keeping in mind that it's one of those things that you may not expect to have material on the other side of your chuck causing inaccuracies or changes as you cut down and machine through a bar of material. The other is tooling. We wanted a finishing insert that could take really light depths of cut and last a really long time. Uh, we called in a tooling rep. They recommended a specific insert, a V stipe with a specific grade, and it's been absolutely great. Uh, we've actually been shocked at how good the tool life is on those inserts. So we wanted to foolproof this process. I didn't want me or anyone else to run these diamond pins when the machine wasn't up to temperature and risk making bad parts. So we were using the spindle temperature reading in the diagnostic screen to tell us when the machine was up to temperature or after we ran the warm-up routine to confirm it was at temperature. And what we realized is almost all of the parameters and values that you're seeing can be traced back to a value in the control and you can access and read that variable. So what we added to the beginning of this program was a simple if statement that checks the value of that temperature for us, it was reading something north of 90 degrees and the actual variable was uh, a number that didn't make sense to me, but we just tracked it at a couple different temperature points and realized, okay, as long as it's above this value, we're good to go. And by adding that into the program, if the machine is not up to temperature, it just M30s, it just stops, it won't run the part. And this is really helpful, not only at the beginning, sometimes after we're done with a batch of these parts, we'll walk over to the machine and not realize we've let it cool down too much. That can really save your butt to remind yourself, okay, we need to run a quicker warm-up routine just to get it right back up to temperature before we resume running the parts. Card here to the NYC CNC page. You can grab that 
sample if statement in code to implement that on your machine. Otherwise, folks, as always, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.